Hi folks, and welcome back to The Original Church. Today's question is, were the original Christians born again or saved? And I'm not asking whether they went to heaven. What I'm asking is, did they refer to themselves as born again or as saved in that sense? Before we can get to the question, we have to ask another question. What is salvation? What would it even mean to be saved? In the Old Testament, salvation is mostly deliverance from something that is life-threatening in this life. And in fact, in the original languages, the words for salvation have as much to do about health and safety as they do about an afterlife or eternal life. And so, in the Old Testament, salvation is mostly about safety and protection in this life. It's only late in Hebrew thought that the idea of salvation becomes something that has to do with the afterlife. And we can see this in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where we can see that there's a debate going on between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees don't believe in resurrection, and the Pharisees do, which means that the Sadducees are still on kind of this ancient world idea that, you know, all believers in the right God go to uh, Hades, which is the underworld, and it really wasn't a question of morality or things like that. The Pharisees were more in this idea of morality leading to what might be someone's eternal destiny, and so they talked about resurrection. But it doesn't really become a big deal until Jesus comes along, and it's Jesus who really makes it all about the afterlife. And he invites everyone into a relationship with God that will lead to eternal life. Now, most of what Jesus taught about what we call heaven concerns the kingdom of heaven, something that exists already in a certain sense, but it's concealed and it has yet to be revealed. It will be fulfilled or fully revealed in the future after Jesus' return and at the time of a general resurrection. And what exists for now in terms of what we call heaven is what Jesus called paradise. As he said to the, the thief on the cross, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. But the point for Jesus is that if you want to be at the party later in the afterlife, you have to accept the invitation now. We can see this in his parable of the wedding banquet, right? If you want to be at the party later, you have to accept the invitation now. And to accept the invitation is what Jesus called repenting. To repent is to turn to God and accept the forgiveness that God offers. Now, the concept of a new birth comes from the writings of the Apostle John. What Jesus called repenting, John calls accepting Christ. Again, accepting the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers. And John said that when we do that, we experience a new birth. We are born again. Although that phrase can also be translated born from above. It's a higher birth, a birth to a higher level of existence, a higher life, a birth to eternal life. And this is what the Apostle Paul called being a new creation. When we accept Christ, we are born again, born from above, and we are a new creation. So the concept of being born again, this heavenly birth, this is the beginning of our eternal life. And it's a new start, to be sure, like turning over a new leaf. But it's only the beginning of the journey. And that beginning, that new birth, is according to the original church, your baptism, even as an infant. Sure, for adults, that might require a decision, but it's not about the decision. It's about the sacrament of baptism. And so when Jesus says that everyone must be born of water and the Spirit, right, all of the church fathers interpreted that as having to do with baptism. And in the original church, baptism and confirmation were together as one rite up until the third century. And so being born of water is the baptism, being born of the Spirit is the confirmation or that laying on of hands. Um, at, at that time, the person would receive the Holy Spirit. 
And uh, we see this also in Paul's letter to Titus, this idea of the bath of rebirth. And so if, if you're not convinced that the rebirth is connected to baptism, look at Titus 3.5. It is called the bath of rebirth. And the church fathers, like I said, all interpreted this idea of being born of water and the Spirit as a reference to baptism. And so the original Christians did not think of their baptism as a done deal. Baptism is a regeneration, yes, but it is not a guarantee of perseverance. It's a new start, but it's not a free ride. So a Christian is born again, yes, but not in the sense that you can't lose your salvation. And that's because in the original church, it was understood that baptism does not wash away future sins. I'll get back to that in a minute. So, did the original Christians think of themselves as saved? Not in the past tense. They would never say, I got saved on such and such a day. Now it's true, in some passages in the New Testament, we do see the word saved used in the past tense like that. In Romans 8.24, and again back to Titus 3.5, Paul talks about how we were saved. But this is a reference to receiving the Holy Spirit. So again, it's baptism and confirmation. Those things would be in the past tense for the believer. But the context makes it clear that it is not a done deal. The journey continues and the struggle goes on. So the past tense of being saved refers to, well, primarily the incarnation and the passion, where someone like Paul will say, he saved us, meaning by coming, by living his life, by dying his death, and by rising again, he saved us. But this is not a reference to an individual's salvation. And even when it is a reference to an individual's salvation, the past tense only refers to the baptism and the confirmation. But even then, it's not only an individual. It's not about a person's decision to become a Christian. It's about the sacrament that was conducted in, within the community of the church. Salvation happens for the original church through the sacraments of the church, not completely separate from the church or completely as an individual. So no one in the original church ever said, I got saved. Because the point is that salvation for any individual is not a point in time. And it's not just about remembering a past event, like a decision I made at one point. It's an ongoing journey of sanctification, a journey that is not done until we enter the eternal realm. Now, a lot of Christians today make a distinction between conversion and sanctification, but the original Christians would not make that distinction. I mean, sure, for pagans coming into the church, that required a decision. But the decision was never as important as the baptism, because the decision was not an end in itself. It was only the beginning. And then even the baptism was only the beginning of the journey. And so conversion, justification, sanctification, it's all one process. The original Christians also did not make distinctions between types of grace, like prevenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace. And there's nothing wrong with these distinctions, but they're more philosophical and they come along later. For the original church, it's all one process. It's all sanctification. It's all a process of growth in which we are moving toward union with God. But perseverance in sanctification is not guaranteed. The process is a process, and you can be moving toward God, but you can also be moving away from God, or you can turn away from God. Even Jesus said, salvation is for those who persevere. And he did not mean to imply that he was going to guarantee that perseverance. And so, in fact, there is no static state for anyone. No one is standing still. You're either moving toward God or away from God. You're either moving toward salvation or away from it. And if you try hard enough, you can change directions. The Protestant Reformation turned salvation into more of a decision. It became a kind of one-time past event 
because they made it all about the switch, the switch from Catholic to Protestant. And so conversion itself was redefined as the moment of logical decision rather than the sacramental initiation. The decision was held up as the main thing, and so for a lot of evangelicals, it still is. And so one can look back on the decision with a sense of satisfaction. But for the original Christians, conversion was seen as a lifelong process, and it was all about looking forward. As I've pointed out in another video, a sacrament is something God does, not something people do. And I think this is all tied together. The Protestant Reformation turned conversion into a decision, and then it turned baptism into a commemoration of that decision. Baptism became more of a public announcement of a human decision that had been made previously, when it should be considered a sacrament that a person receives from God in that moment. And the grace that comes in that sacrament well, that's only the beginning of the journey. And so to say, I got saved in the past tense would sound very foreign to the original Christians. They would say at most, I am being saved, or I am going on towards salvation. They would have a hope of their salvation, and they would have a certain confidence in the mercy of God. But they knew that there was no guarantee, not in the sense that God would prevent someone from rejecting him. A person can lose salvation by engaging in a lifestyle of rejecting God, uh, rejecting God's commandments, that is, through a lifestyle of mortal sin. Nevertheless, the original Christians did not live in fear of damnation. They just knew that being on the path to salvation was a lifestyle, a lifestyle that you had to keep up. And remember, Jesus said, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. And so being saved, moving on towards salvation, takes actively remaining connected to Christ all throughout one's life. And the primary way that the original Christians remained connected to Christ was through the regular reception of the Eucharist. And that's how it was in the original church. Hey, thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. I really appreciate that. Please share this video with your friends and please join me in the Original Church Community on Locals.com. Don't forget that if you join the Original Church Community on Locals.com, you can join me each week for a live, in-depth, chronological Bible study. It's live streamed every Saturday, but you can watch it later if you're not available. So join me for that and I'll see you there. I hope to see you there. I hope to see you there and I'll see you there.